Welcome to Learning with Learner, where we embark on a transformative journey of knowledge and personal growth. I'm Lindsay Lerner, your dedicated host and guide as we delve into the depths of unconventional wisdom. Together, we'll explore the stories and insights of remarkable trailblazers who have forged their own paths. Brace yourselves for thought-provoking conversations, profound insights, and eye-opening experiences. Our mission is to challenge the norm, ignite curiosity, and empower you to embrace your unique journey. This is Learning with Learner. Welcome to Learning with Learner, where today we are diving into the fascinating world of startups and venture capital. We have a special guest, Patrick Driscoll, an accomplished general partner at Chasing Rainbows with an impressive track record in supporting LGBTQ plus led companies. He's a force to be reckoned with, having led global VC education programs and accelerator initiatives. We'll explore his journey from sourcing deals to fostering diversity in the startup ecosystem. Get ready for an inspiring conversation with Patrick, a true innovator and champion for change in the impact-driven startup world. Let's get started. Let's start at the beginning. Can you tell us about your background, where you grew up, and maybe shed a little light on how your early experiences have shaped your journey through the world thus far? Ooh, great question. Getting back to childhood. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and then moved, my family moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where my mother was from. My dad is from Boston when I was about two. And Grew up in a pretty nice neighborhood in Pittsburgh, uh, super into sports and outdoorsy things, typical, you know, Boy Scout involved in the community. My parents were super involved in like our church and volunteering and doing all those fun things. And so we basically had a white picket fence childhood. Then uh, my dad, unfortunately, passed away when I was about 11 or 12 and that's kind of when life got a little bit more complicated and the white picket fence sort of burnt to the ground and there was a lot of issues that our family had to overcome and in terms of dealing with finances my mom had three burgeoning teenagers i have a twin sister and a brother who's a little bit older than us, about 18 months. So she had her hands absolutely full and she worked for a nonprofit in Pittsburgh. So we we definitely, you know, had food on the table and nothing was super uncomfortable for us. But there were some dynamics at play there that forced us all to grow up quite quickly, which was good. My mom made us all get jobs at the earliest possible time, which was great. Uh, so I think I was 14, busing tables at restaurants. And that kind of instilled a work ethic, which I'm super appreciative of. And to this day, I'm very thankful to my mom in general for what she was able to pull off because we were not easy children. We were loud and outgoing and we hosted parties when she was out, you know, taking one of us to university trips and she'd come home and scream at us and all that jazz. But she also was the one that pushed me to pursue kind of my dreams. And I ended up going on a mission trip, which kind of shaped a lot of my interests, both professionally and personally, to Haiti that I had to fund, you know, send out like letters to family and friends, like typed it up and everyone would send like a $25 check, which was super fun and spent about three weeks in Haiti. And that's kind of what spurred my interest in international development and economic empowerment and helping folks without access to resources, get access to resources. And that I think has become like a pretty underlying current in my entire life. And Definitely. then of course, <laughs> if you scroll I, through your resume, <laughs> yeah, it all makes sense. <laughs> and then of course I was a burgeoning little homosexual and that was on mission uh, trips. <laughs> that was like, exactly. And I was trying to keep everything secret and was deeply mm. closeted and went to an all boys Catholic high school. I went to a Catholic grade school, lots of fun guilt around being gay and trying to hide it. And, and trying to force myself to have girlfriends and all that stuff. So all these things kind of like set the stage for weirdly where I am now in my, you know, mid thirties. And if you trace it all back to 
that mission trip to Haiti, <laughs> being a closeted homosexual, Catholic guilt, all that stuff. Oof. It all oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then did you – I know obviously you were closeted, but did you tell – like did you not tell a soul or is there anybody that you were able to confide in? For sure. My brother, uh, the night before I left for my freshman year of college, I told him that mm-hmm. I was bisexual, okay. uh, which is – you know was my little foot out the door. I was also telling people – all over the place online and like chat rooms that were anonymous that just be like, I am gay. I just needed to get it out as loud as humanly possible. But I told my brother. And then by the time I made it to freshman year of university at American university in Washington, DC, which was at the time, I think the number one university ranked for LGBTQ plus students. So I was thrilled to get there and just come bursting out of the closet. And then of course I did not do that. And instead joined a fraternity and, was deeply involved in bro culture and all that stuff. Not in any problematic way. It was a really great group of guys and and stuff like that, but forced me back into the closet until really my junior year when I was just like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm going, going numb with just hiding everything so much. And I would tell my female friends specifically. And so I finally decided to come out to all of my really good, like male friends, which for some reason is more difficult to me, but it's weirdly common uh, in the, in the gay male space anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. For sure. It's interesting. I also came out junior year, which was a journey in and of itself. So I understand. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. And then I came bursting out and it was, you know, couldn't hold me back. I, I felt like I had, I'd been like looking for something to really be passionate about. And I was studying international relations and I loved, I wanted to get involved in USAID. I wanted to be an ambassador. I wanted to, go into emerging economies and help save the world, which is very sometimes problematically white savior complex, which I didn't learn until later in my career. So I I was able to do a lot of directing of my passions into that economic development, international relations thing, but also the LGBTQ aspect became important. I I volunteered at the HRC in DC at, at their headquarters, which was amazing. The human rights campaign and kind of the the rest is history. Yeah. And and growing up, were there any specific role models or mentors who were able to assist you through this process, whether it was, you know, younger high school days and then further on in college? There was a teacher, Brother Ernest Miller, who was very, he was a brother, so in the Catholic church, but he was a very flamboyant very kind of theatrical the way that he taught. He taught world history. He was so engaging and not, it's one of those teacher stories that I just was mesmerized by him in the classroom. He, the way that he, you know, taught, he got me involved in, I think it was the Darfur crisis back in when I was a senior in high school. And he organized a march in DC that he took a lot of his favorite students on. So we, we took a bus to DC and marched for the Save Darfur, which is really great. He got me involved in like a leadership position in that campaign, which was the first time that I realized that because I was so closeted in high school, I just wanted to float in the background and not be, I didn't want anyone to look at me. I just wanted to make it through high school to get to college where I could come out. That was like my goal. But he saw something in me that you know, was indicated to him that I would become a good leader or be a good leader. So he kind of forced me into this uncomfortable zone and he was great. And then I found out years later that he had a whole life before it became a brother. And he's, he's just a very fascinating individual. And I have nothing but appreciation for what I learned from him. And it was a brother in a Catholic church like school, which you never would expect. You're in college, involved in, you know, promoting all things LGBTQ related and finally out and feeling presumably good about that. And then on the other hand, all things international aid related. Where did work start to come into the picture and how did you really start to to grow from a career standpoint? For sure. My first job, I if you go to undergrad in DC, you're expected to have an internship like before you even get to university. It's ridiculously competitive of of a city and anyone that went to like Georgetown or American or GW will tell you it's 
So I had a lot of great internships in undergrad, including on the Hill with Senator Bob Casey, which was super fun to be walking the halls of the Senate building and and see where history was. I remember John McCain gave me directions right after he lost the election. And he was so nice. I was like, I actively campaigned against you, sir, but you are blowing my mind with how like kind you are. I can't. The, the dissonance in my brain, was it was hard to connect the dots. And my first job was with a USA contractor called IRG, which is no longer around. They did USA contracts all over the world. I was hoping to go abroad with them and they ended up not it didn't work out. So I was getting impatient and I was writing all these, but my job was basically to write, rewrite CVs so that they fit proposals really well. So I was going down some rabbit holes of these amazing professionals in international development with decades of experience that spoke like nine languages. They were from all over the globe and it was really kind of inspirational for me. So I realized I had to go back to school because in international development, you need a master's. And I found the Peace Corps Master's International Program, which was basically where you pair your Peace Corps service with a graduate degree and they subsidize tuition and and it's all kind of like correlated. So when I ended up going to the University of Denver for Global Finance, Trade and Economic Integration, which was my degree title, and then that was partnered with my Peace Corps service in Senegal. So I served for two years in a small little town called Socon, which I still Uh, I'm still in contact with my host family and a lot of my friends on the ground there. And I miss it and really want to get back there hopefully next year, which was a huge eye-opening experience in many ways, which is where I really learned the problematic aspects of white saviorism. My favorite little anecdote was the French government paid for a huge seed oil press, this massive machine that was like three stories tall. The, I think, French ambassador to Senegal, there's a huge Senegalese cabinet member, the mayor of my town, all of these people came for the photo op, ribbon cutting, yada, yada. I was there because I was like the token Peace Corps volunteer. And two months later, after all of this press and write-ups and stuff, it broke. And no one knew how to fix it. And it just sat there as like an eyesore, which was kind of one of the issues with development in general. And I was there to teach financial literacy for entrepreneurs. And that I think really, because if, if you teach entrepreneurs better entrepreneurship practices, like that's, then they take that and they run and they crush it, right? You're not building this infrastructure that's going to break or, or you're not pouring money that's going to be a waste. You're finding folks that are already entrepreneurial and you're giving them a little bit of a framework. They're probably already pretty good at it. A lot of them had been running businesses for like years. And I just was this random 25 year old who was like, let's, let me teach you how to do bookkeeping. And they would kind of listen because they got, you know, they got an experience out of it, engaging with the U S uh, person. But for the most part, they were like kind of fine. But that also made me realize that I loved that finding entrepreneurial people and just helping them with access to education, access to capital, access to talent, access to whatever they might need in order to be a better entrepreneur, which was another kind of like refocused. My career just started as like a big unfocused blob, but it was, there were like lanes and then it kept on getting kind of more and more focused. And this was one of those key moments where I realized that helping entrepreneurs was kind of a key to drive economic empowerment and economic development everywhere. Yeah, without a doubt. And do you have, I guess, two-part question. Do you have a definition of whether it's entrepreneur or entrepreneurship that you stand by? And is there a same and or different definition that either the Peace Corps gave you or more of this international aid lens gave you? And did those jive or not so much? Ooh, interesting. So I would say... You know, the broad definition of entrepreneurship is creating value via an expertise or specialty in a product or service that is available to a greater community. I just made that up off the top of my head. I don't know if that's the best definition of entrepreneurship for an for an exchange pretty good. of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Whether it be money or trade or or whatever. I think those definitions across the board kind of are aligned 
the Peace Corps and I think the development community would define it similarly. In terms of where I am now in tech and startups and venture capital, obviously there's more, there's differences between how I define a startup versus a small business or an SME or micro enterprise. So those definitions get a little wonky, but entrepreneurship in general, I think is just adding value via a good or service to a larger group of people, I'd say. Yeah, I, th- I just think it's interesting in terms of how much culture impacts, I mean, definitions of words in general and the oh. the stereotypes that go along with it. And, you know, I, I remember when my, my good friend was in the Peace Corps in Namibia and meeting a lot of the, to your point, small business owners and different tradespeople and craftspeople that we had interacted with, you know, the couple weeks that I was there and she was there like you for two years. And it was just so interesting to think about that journey and that experience and those interactions versus the, especially this is like 10 years ago, this hustle and grind culture of San Francisco and of startups and of tech. And very different. (laughs) Those things are so interesting. (laughs) From that perspective, very different. I mean, Senegal now has a burgeoning tech ecosystem, which didn't exist when I was there, which I love. And I, the government has done a really good job of trying to get capital into Senegal to invest into startups and tech for Francophone Africa is like, a trade block, the economic community of West African states, as it's so, as it's otherwise known. And, but you are correct. Like culturally, it's wildly different in, in terms of what your goals are. The, the goals for the people that I was interacting with in Senegal were much more like, I want to provide for my family, you know, potentially expand out of that, maybe start, if I have a successful restaurant, maybe I'll open up another one. But it wasn't like, if I haven't opened up six restaurants in three years, I'm a failure. You know what I mean? Which is yeah. SF culture sometimes. Exactly. Exactly. So people were just way more content with, you know, being successful, but like defining success. How you defined success in Senegal, I think, was a little different than how you define success in SF or New York or, or US in general, I'd say. Sure. Yeah, I think I just think that's interesting, an interesting perspective, especially now that you're obviously in San Francisco and in VC and in tech and in all of those things. I think it's refreshing to have somebody with your lived experience now in, in this role. And I think that that's something that's really, really powerful. You, I know that you've led, you know, a handful of different VC education programs and have trained hundreds, I'm assuming at this point (laughs) of, of individual VCs. Were there any, any particular transformative experiences that you've you've witnessed being able to bring your diverse background of experiences to this venture capital more intense world for sure i i was so fortunate to after peace corps i, I worked i spent time in colombia and bogota for about a year and then mexico city for a few years and i was in la working for the us small business administration doing financial institution training on better lending practices to small businesses. So again, I was still in education, but for lending institutions, I was in education for entrepreneurs in Senegal. And then I saw a VC and an accelerator manager. I was was on a panel with them at Mary Garcetti's office in LA and realized that that's what I wanted to do. I had never really heard about VC. My mind was blown. I was like taking notes secretly, even though I was on a panel (laughs) Uh, And I was able to find a job back in Mexico City with 500 startups, now 500 global, where I was going to, where I ran investor education programs. And the stars truly aligned because my background was educating folks in entrepreneurship and lending. It all kind of made sense for me to be involved in these education programs for, for investors with 500. And 500 as a global brand, you know, I moved back to Mexico City, was based there. And really got to see from the international perspective how many investors were were popping up all over the globe that were interested in learning from Silicon Valley experts and folks in the U.S. that had been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years. So our cohorts, which were so eye-opening and amazing, were I think 30 plus countries are represented and each of them there are 50, they got up to 55 students I think was the largest one that I ran at Stanford. And we had folks, my favorite, it was during the World Cup, just a quick anecdote, Senegal was playing Colombia and I lived in Colombia and lived in Senegal and we had a Senegalese student and a Colombian student and everybody went absolutely wild. It was so fun. 
And that was great. So in terms of transformational experiences, just being in a room full of that many diverse folks that are all interested in investing into their local startup ecosystem and being good investors and figuring out best practices and being part of the solution to, because they weren't all necessarily focused in economic development, right? They're, they're focused in returning money for their LPs or whoever they're responsible to, to make money for. But in, in and of itself, in a lot of these places, it's inherently developing the economy if you are starting to grow a startup ecosystem which was super exciting to me. And I saw so many great firms that launched out of that, even in the US, you know, Mac Conwell from Airbnb Ventures attended one of the cohorts, the Lita Taub of Ghana's Ventures attended the cohort, attended the Stanford, or she attended the Berkeley program, excuse me, deal camp. And uh, Monique Woodard from Cake Ventures, so many amazing folks who are now leaders in the VC space, specifically in the underrepresented totally community are. blends, <laughs> yeah. are people that went, I, I take no credit for how badass they are, but I was part of their story and that is enough for me. And just being able to, and Melissa Velasaris, excuse me, Maria Velasaris from Steel Sky Ventures, so many cool people and all of, and watching what they've been able to accomplish is such a, they're like my heroes. And now I'm kind of doing it myself, and it's really cool to, to be in this cycle that they've already gone through. For those that don't know of all of the incredible work that you're doing now, tell me more. For sure. So I mentioned my LGBTQ plus advocacy, my VC work, education, yada, yada, got into VC. I'm finally able to really combine all of my passions into this VC fund called Chasing Rainbows. So Chasing Rainbows is an early stage VC fund that was launched by Ben Stokes, my business partner in 2020, to invest into LGBTQ plus early stage companies. One founder has to be LGBTQ plus, sector agnostic. We are focusing in four pillars, which include climate, access to education, health equity, and financial inclusion. But we, we remain generally sector agnostic. For example, the four companies we've identified, one is in climate, carbon capture, one is in AI kind of skincare technology, one is in deal doc, legal doc, artificial intelligence understanding, I guess, is that's not the proper way to, to frame it, but I need to but whatever. It's a great company. And then the final one is in a Discord community building app that's looking to it's to integrate with the Discord community to really connect people with one another. So we're kind of across the board, right? And these founders who are all LGBTQ+, a, a variety of acronyms under that acronym, or a variety of letters under that acronym, they it's just so fun to engage with so many badass people that happen to be LGBTQ plus and have historically had difficulty raising capital because of a variety of issues or barriers and hurdles that they've had to overcome as someone who's trans or someone who's a queer person of color or someone who's non-binary or even someone who's too femme or too mask. When they step into a room with investors who all look a certain way which is, you know, straight, cis, male, and typically white. And those people don't know how to engage with someone who might be super, uh, a, a male identifying person who's super femme, or perhaps a trans person, or someone who is intersectional. God forbid, they, there's so much, there's a lack of affinity towards people, which is, there's an affinity bias thing that's always talked about. Uh, which is part of the problem where people will invest only in other people that look and act and come like them and come from similar backgrounds. So the LGBTQ plus population dealing with a lot of straight cis white male investors, obviously there's a lack of affinity there in many ways. So there's lack of access to capital, same with female founders, same with founders of color, same with immigrant founders, all of these underrepresented groups have issues there. So it's, I'm finally able to be part of the solution specifically for the LGBTQ plus founder community, which is absolutely great. 
yeah, absolutely. It definitely makes a makes a humongous difference. I've had investors in the past that were not queer friendly, and I didn't know that they weren't queer friendly until after we were <laughs> working together, which led to a lot of issues. And so it's definitely from firsthand experience. I'm cringing internally and grateful that you exist now. Other facts, figures, statistics, anything that could shed light on this issue at, at large. I think a lot of people know about it. They don't necessarily know any in the weeds details. And then on top of that, I think the other thing is, what do you do about it? If you're not Patrick and you're not starting your own, own fund, what are smaller executable steps that other other folks who may be listening may be able to get in on? For sure. Just, you know, some quick stats, which are horrendous. It's between 0.5 and 0.7% of VC funding goes to LGBTQ plus founders. More than 75% of founders keep their sexual identity secret, or they, you know, folks even take down their Instagram pages, they make everything invisible. So investors will do due diligence on a company, and they will look at social media oftentimes. And if you're waving your little rainbow flag and stuff, oftentimes founders are like, I got to take all that down just because it's perceived as a risk, which is really depressing if you think about it. The majority of VC funds that focus in underrepresented communities also don't focus in LGBTQ+. So there's a lot of funds that focus in women or founders of color or other groups, but the LGBTQ plus focus is missing in the vast majority of them. And there's even been examples of investors using kind of the vice clause, which is horrible, which basically prevents investors from investing in companies that are in like cannabis or, you know, alcohol or firearms or whatever, because their LPs don't want them to invest into those types of companies. It's called the vice clause. It's pretty large and kind of uh, obfuscated in a bit, but there are investors that will use that to get out of investing into queer founders because it's perceived as immoral or whatever. So that's kind of sad. Definitely. But there are so many great organizations that are out there well, it's it's money talks, right? And now that there have been LGBTQ plus founders that have changed the way that we view the world, ChatGBT wouldn't be around without an LGBTQ plus founder. Like Turo, PayPal, Varu, like Guideline, Madison Reed, SiriusXM, all of these global brands have LGBTQ plus founders and have made a lot of people a lot of money. And again, money talks. So it's one, a thing that I always tell other VCs who are allies is not to forget the power of the LGBTQ+, our ability to adapt and to fight through hardship. And historically, we've been persecuted immensely. You know, in the U.S., outside of the coast where it's safe, you know, in, in the kind of the Midwest and some other states, there are legislation, there's legislation that's trying to make it super difficult for someone to be trans or to figure out how they identify anti drag queen bills, which is perplexing to me. So all of these things that are happening in the U S is having a net negative impact that trickles down to the economy, in my opinion, and entrepreneurship for LGBTQ plus founders. So people can of course get involved in politics and try to fight against all of these bills, which is desperately needed. I also think we need more LGBTQ plus people running for office. So if anyone out there is thinking about it, I might know some folks that can help get you off the ground and just, you know, arm yourself with stats. All of these great companies are doing wonderful things for the world. There are organizations also like Start Out, Gangels is huge, Out in Tech, Lesbians Who Tech. These affinity groups are helping to build the next generation of tech leaders, entrepreneurs, investors. LGBTVC recently launched earlier this year. They had a great summit in New York. So get involved in those organizations if you want to learn a little bit about if you've ever considered being an entrepreneur or starting a startup. And not even a startup. If you want to start a, a typical small business or a micro enterprise, check out your the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. The SBA has, the Small Business Administration has, 
programs focused in the LGBTQ plus community. We're so fortunate to be living in a time where all of these entities are working to actively empower the LGBTQ plus community because 10, 15 years ago, it was my fund couldn't exist. There wasn't enough LGBTQ plus leadership in the tech startup investor space for it to be a viable option to have a fund that focused in the LGBTQ plus community. But now there's like the community number alone of all those groups is like hundreds of thousands of people, which is amazing. Yeah, uh, it's inspiring without a doubt. You have a whole hell of a lot of professional experience, but obviously outside of that, you've also engaged with a ton of LGBTQ plus youth through your public speaking, international programs. How has that work with these young folks really shaped your perspective on the importance of mentorship and networks for these underrepresented groups and underrepresented communities? Community helps out community. LGBTQ plus community specifically is a found family. And people say that for a reason. And in terms of how I engage with my mentors, what which has shaped how I engage with my mentees and even younger folks, even folks looking to break into VC that are older than me or, or whatever, my mentors have opened up so many doors, have been so useful. I have had full on emotional breakdowns with them and they are accepting of of them. Uh, and maybe they happen more often than I'd like to admit. But without my mentors who, who in a variety of parts of my career have and remain very much like door openers and perspective openers and people that I can trust to, you know, just help talk through a problem or something difficult, whether it even be a personal issue Right. And I try to do the same thing with my mentees. And I love when I get an email from somebody or a LinkedIn message from somebody who's graduating from undergrad or their MBA and they found my LinkedIn profile. They're curious about venture capital or LGBTQ plus advocacy and they want to hop on a quick 15, 30 minute call. And I'm like, 100%, let's do it. How, what are your goals? What do you want to do? How do you get there? Let's help lay out a plan and be strategic, be a strategic sounding board more than just someone who tells you what to do, because that is also a sign of a bad mentor is be like, you need to do this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> Whereas my trajectory has been nothing but irregular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that being an advocate as a mentor means you have to be a, as adaptable as the mentee in terms of helping them get to like where their end goals are. And everyone needs a mentor you know, find one and ask. And most people want to be mentors. I'd say you probably have some curmudgeons up top that are like, I can't do it. Or perhaps someone is just super busy. But I, I always tell people to go after folks that are their heroes or, or someone they want to emulate and, and just ask them. It's super necessary. It's super needed, especially to your point about having that, that found family. I don't know what your personal experience was after you came out, how your family perceived that or handled or navigated that. But I know for a lot of friends that it, it was incredibly difficult. And so being able to find that community and build camaraderie again is, is huge, especially in such a cutthroat industry like venture capital and being in the, in the startup realm. Yeah. And a lot of founders, there's a friends and family round for early stage founders. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot <laughs> I've of LGBTQ. Tell, right? me, tell, tell me, me more, more about that. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of LGBTQ plus folks lose their friends and family when they come out of the closet. It's a sad truth. And especially if they come from, you know, either a, a region of the US or a country where being an LGBTQ plus person means you're getting persecuted and you have to flee to a larger city or whatever, you're starting from scratch. You don't have friends or family you can go to to ask for a thousand dollar check, a five thousand dollar check, a twenty five thousand dollar check. I mean, most underrepresented communities also don't have access to generational wealth. So friends and family can't even help that much. So being a found family or you know, the LGBTQ plus community is oftentimes a found family for a lot of folks. Like 
it's it's different when you are asking people that you have found for money, but it's also very empowering to be able to do so because these folks are accepting of you and love you for who you are and all that stuff. And when we were figuring out our positioning for Chasing Rainbows, we realized that we wanted to be the friends and family round for LGBTQ plus founders so they can you know, be their fantastic queer selves when they're chatting with us about their business and not have to take down their Instagram page or uh, hide. I got chills as you said that. <laughs> <laughs> or hide, you know, talking about their partner or the difficulty they faced the other day because they walked into a restroom and somebody yelled at them. You know what I mean? Like we, we want to be uh, just available and like open so you could be comfortable in your authentic self. That's fantastic. Mm. Makes me so happy. Truly. It's like, it's so inspiring and so needed. And it's, I'm, I'm super grateful that, that Chasing Rainbows exists. So I'm glad. Good job. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, the goal is to make it into a firm and, you know, there's more, now there's more, there's colorful capital, there's, uh, uh, pride fund based out of Ohio. There are, there are more VCs that are coming up that are working together in order to bolster the community. And it's, it's, it's definitely an all hands on deck type of thing, but like, let's pull more people on deck from the water so we can start. That's what LGBT VC is doing. Their goal is to get more queer people in the investor VC type roles where they can deploy capital. Cause obviously underrepresented groups typically invest into underrepresented founders or they're more likely and LGBTQ plus investors are way more likely to invest into LGBTQ plus investors getting back to the affinity bias in like a good way affinity bias for good (laughs) (laughs) as opposed to for evil (laughs) yes yes totally totally and on the on the personal side of things I mean all of the work that you're doing is incredibly demanding both physically emotionally spiritually all the things like from our conversations, I know that you're giving, you know, more than 110% into this. How are you able to be able to take care of your self, take care of that adorable dog that you have and be able to continue, you know, to keep your head on? Because obviously you need to be able to, to do that in order to continue to make the positive impact that you've been, been having. I, I think I can like literally quantify it into three areas that help keep me grounded. One is obviously my dog, who is a border collie Australian shepherd, so loving cuddle monster dog named Sochi Milko, Sochi for short. So he, you know, just keeps me busy. And if I need a break or had a hard call or whatever, I'll just like collapse and he'll come over and lay his head on my shoulder and it's adorable. Two would be running. So I just did the SF marathon last week. I run a lot. And it is my sanity check. I can reflect on things. I remember things I forgot in the middle of a run. It's a great way to just reorient myself and kind of clear my head, but also get organized in a weird way. And then three is improv comedy. So I love, love, love (laughs) improv comedy. It's Very cool. something I got into when I was in the Peace Corps, actually. I, I discovered all these podcasts that were about improv comedy. And I've taken now courses at UCB. When I'm running, I listen to improv. When I'm walking my dog, I'm listening to improv. It's like VC podcast, some sort of self-help <laughs> podcast, and then like three yes. improv comedy podcasts. It's like the directory I try to maintain. When you first and, said it, I had a vision of, of improv comedy in Senegal and that was also hilarious and not where you were going. <laughs> I remember there was a queer improv <laughs> podcast. It wasn't an imp- per se. It was called, um, it's called now called Attitudes with um, Aaron Gibson and Brian Safi. And they were talking about, it was all LGBT issues and issues that affect women. And it's kind of a comedy news podcast, but they're both, they both come from improv And I was sitting in a car in Senegal, surrounded by all these Senegalese women. And they were talking about like, interesting, queer sex stories. And I just was like giggling to myself, because I was like, if only people knew what I was listening to in this podcast. Uh, Because being LGBTQ plus in Senegal is illegal, unfortunately. So it was, it was super, it, it definitely got me through a lot of stuff in Senegal. That was difficult listening to these queer stories, queer comedians, 
uh, I love queer improv comedy specifically, but I'm open to all improv comedy. And so those are the three things. Yeah, I think my dog running an improv comedy. Looking ahead, what are your aspirations for the LGBTQ plus slash impact driven startup ecosystem? And what are your plans to continue to really contribute to its growth and this positive change that you've had and continuing to grow that? For sure. You know, we're, we're growing a firm with Chasing Rainbows. So this is fund one. We which is 10 million. We plan on raising fund two, which will be substantially larger and then continuing to raise funds to actively invest into the LGBTQ plus community. We are targeting high return companies. So we're being pretty diligent about the companies we select because we also want to prove that LGBTQ plus founders will outperform our peers. So there's a little bit of pressure riding on our shoulders around overperforming for our LPs, our limited partners. So then they're going to be more likely to invest into the next LGBTQ plus fund who can then deploy money again into the LGBTQ plus community and other underrepresented communities. So that's kind of our path forward. I also love connecting with other emerging managers and fund managers and LGBTQ plus investors to make sure that we all are aware of one another and interconnected so that we can benefit from all of our networks, because it is an exponential benefit if we all work together as opposed to our smokestacked individual kind of networks and skill sets. And uh, that's happening. We, I think, had a kickoff meeting with a, a bunch of power players in the LGBTQ plus space, founder space and startup space and VC space a couple weeks ago. And our one of the main projects that we're beginning to tackle is tagging LGBTQ plus founders, because a lot of VCs have immense portfolios. And if you ask them if they have any queer founders, they're like, I don't know. You know, it has, that isn't in our diligence process where that's awkward for us to ask and all these things. But it's a missing data point that could be useful in so many ways. So we're trying to figure out a way to help other VC funds more, uh, I don't want to say mainstream, but more like, I don't know, agnostic in terms of sexual identity <laughs> VC funds. Um, figure out how to identify the LGBTQ plus founders in their portfolio. So it's it's a really good think tank group of people and I'm super thrilled to be a part of it. And we're all just trying to figure out how to make it easier for us to get access to capital and provide access to capital to people that are overlooked. Totally. That's so cool. And that was going to be my second to last question, but now I need to ask just to level the playing field for those who are listening, if you could give a brief brief overview of how VC works or at least how it works for you and thus the structure of, you know, LPs and what, what, what is VC and what's an LP and how, how does, what's a fund, what's a firm and, and those sorts of sorts of words that we haven't defined yet. Yeah. Uh, I, I always forget when I, <laughs> that I'm so in the weeds that I need to explain things. So chasing rainbows is, I'll just use that as the example. Chasing rainbows is the firm. We're raising fund one which is $10 million. We're raising that money from limited partners. Limited partners are high net worth individuals, family offices, institutions, endowments, etc. that can give money. So there are investors. So we are general partners of the fund. The limited partners invest into us and we invest into startups. So we're like the middle people of this transaction. And the LPs trust us to diversify on their to, to invest in, on their behalf into a diverse set of startups and make them money. So we're beholden to our LPs. So that's kind of the the, the typical structure. There's also I don't know this is too granular, but there's a management company which myself and Ben are a part of, which is separate from the funds. So that's why that that's what enables us to be able to raise fund one, fund two, fund three where the Chasing Rainbows kind of management company over here and the LPs, which can grow and shrink and all that stuff. And as we grow larger, we grow with larger funds, we'll likely bring in more either general partners or associates or platform people to help the firm actually scale to be a team of individuals, much like a lot of our friends and colleagues have done in the past. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
well, we'll be ready for that. So I know if you know of any, <laughs> any great LGBTQ plus <laughs> investors or people looking to break in, let me know. Totally. Totally. Well, that's, that's what we're here for. So now the official last question, two parts. Hope you're ready. <laughs> what is the worst piece of advice they've ever gotten? And of course, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten? I think the worst piece of advice I've ever gotten is, uh, this might be a hot take, but f- plan out your life. Like, what are your goals? How do you get there? You need to figure out systematic ways to get there. Yada, yada. No, 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 no. I think being adaptable and seeing where life takes you and pivoting and you get an opportunity over here that's wildly different from what you were maybe expecting or comfortable with like throw yourself in the deep end and get uncomfortable with it quickly because you're going to learn from that way more so if you're just continuing in a straight linear path towards this goal that you think that you actually want i wouldn't be in bc if you would have asked me when i was 22 years old what i would be doing at age i'm 35 now what i would be doing at age 35 I, I didn't even know adventure. I had no concept of venture capital or investing or finance or numbers or anything. I just wanted to literally live in a hut in sub-Saharan Africa, helping folks with access to clean drinking water and education. That was that was my goal, and I wouldn't be here without kind of taking chances and and living a little bit uh, riskier. I guess, which maybe makes me a better venture capital investor because I have been able to take risks and live outside of the U.S. and all these interesting locations, which is also a huge piece of advice I would recommend to people. And then the best piece of advice, yeah, if it makes you uncomfortable, do it anyway. <laughs> uh, yes. And like, in obviously in a safe way. <laughs> um, totally. But if you're terrified to do it, I would cons- I would still do it if someone asks you to speak on a panel or if someone is asking you to maybe take on a new project or mentor someone or or get involved in something and you think you're not the right person, you don't have that experience, you're not good enough, the imposter syndrome of it all, just do it because they obviously think that you're good enough and that you can do it if you're being asked to do it. And you you typically are. And also realize that everybody kind of feels that way when they're getting started. Like I, there's no way, shape or form that I should be asked to speak on this panel with all of these badass people. Like they, this is a mistake. I shouldn't be here, but you know, you got to do it. And, and also even things that don't, that aren't handed to you. If you see a fellowship or a program you're interested in or an education program and you're like, I don't know, I don't qualify for this. They'll never choose me. All that stuff. A, you never know, and B, you might get in, and that could change everything about where your future is headed. So just take chances, you know, and if it makes you uncomfortable, just goddamn do it anyway. And on that note, hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing all of your stories and your anecdotes today, and I hope everyone learned quite a bit. I know I did. Yeah, for sure. It has been a pleasure, Lindsay, and I uh, look forward to chatting further. Thank you for listening to Learning with Learner and hearing the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com. Or if you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening and have an awesome day.